Hi, I'm Chris Philpott, and this is The 100th Monkey. effects on this DVD, including the 100th monkey, where a volunteer from the audience mind reads someone else. The more people concentrate on this, the better. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> There's also speechless, where you take away someone's ability to read. Just right here. Okay. This will be temporary. You will get it back. No more. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. You guys can read this? Uh -huh. It doesn't make sense. What well, sound it out for me, if you could? Uh, Kosisni. Kosisni. That's really uh, close. That's actually really <laughs> close. That's just sound it out. I'm Chris Philpott, and this is the hundredth monkey slash speechless slash the sixth cent. So what's in this package? Number one, postcards. Number two, a couple of DVDs. Uh, one you've obviously found um, that has verbal instructions on it. The other one has uh, JPEG artwork and uh, a PDF of uh, the written instructions. The labels may say everything's on one. There was a little last minute switcheroo. So it was just so much easier to navigate with all the material on two DVDs. So you have two now. Um, I'm going to try to keep these brief. Um, it may mean that I'll have to edit the wrap out of this. Maybe not. I've ordered these instructions a little differently than the written ones. Um, with these, I'm going to start with the easiest, simplest, most straightforward effect. I do exactly the opposite in the written instructions because, you know, the people who prefer written instructions, they want to get into the, you know, all the details and meat. Uh, so um, that's what I do. There are a lot of different methods used for these effects, uh, but the central one used in everything here is something called hybrid images. Hybrid images, um, it, it's two images superimposed on each other, uh, one uh, using long wavelengths, one using short wavelengths, but basically it looks different whether you view it close up versus far away. So you may have seen on the internet Marilyn Monroe morphing into Albert Einstein. Uh, that's a hybrid image. Hybrid images look cool, but it's not convincing. I mean, you look at that one, she doesn't all totally switch over to him. I spent a lot of time playing around with it and discovered that it actually works really well with words, especially words that look similar. Um, the same number of letters, uh, the same first and last letters. Then, all of a sudden, the illusion just becomes so convincing. Uh, so this opened up a lot of possibilities. Um, the effects on this DVD, there are some others I'll be releasing shortly. Sometimes the illusion is so perfect it looks like real magic. But it is a light-based illusion, so you have to be aware of the lighting. 
it doesn't really work in a really dim room unless you just happen to be under a spot, uh, in which case it'll work fine. Um, it doesn't work, for example, with someone who has terrible vision. Um, so, as you would with a book test, don't choose someone who has terrible vision to be your on-stage volunteer. Yeah, I'm going to need someone who doesn't need reading glasses uh, to help me up on stage. Done. You know, no one thinks of anything because there's reading involved. The relative lighting and really bright light, the audience, uh, you have to make sure the audience is seated a little farther back. Fortunately, you can test all these things beforehand, but I'm just saying, just be aware of them. Just do a little test. You know, 30 seconds before, uh, before you perform is more than enough time to see the relative distance you need to make the illusion perfect for both the on-stage volunteer and for the people out in the audience. One other thing that affects the illusion is whether you're filming it or not. Uh, cameras almost always tend to see the far away version, even if they're quite close. So that's going to make this uh, tutorial a little awkward because I'm going to be showing you cards and you're going to be seeing one thing and I see quite something different. Just be aware of that going in. Now this will affect um, television performances if you want to do this on television. By the way, you are totally free to do that. Um, I do uh, encourage you to give me a call. Uh, Joe Skilton did my tossed up book test on Masters of Illusion. Joe contacted me and I worked with him. As magic creators, we all want our effects to be just perfect, especially on television where a lot of people are going to see it. So feel free to contact me. You have the rights to do it. And if you want to do it on TV, by all means. But I perhaps can help in that regard. Your package comes with 12 cards. Let me talk about the cards for a moment. Ten of them are for um, Speechless, two are for the hundredth monkey. Now you'll notice when you look at the files uh, to make these, um, that some are labeled bright, some are labeled dim, and some are labeled mid. These give you an idea of the kind of uh, light levels that is appropriate to use that card in. Um, I try to give you uh, a selection here. The ones on top are bright, uh, uh, cards intended for bright light. The ones on the bottom are intended for low light. Notice, notice also the, the wording is much smaller on the cards meant for bright light. Um, that, um, that helps with uh, the illusion in really bright light. Um, they're larger in, in, in dim light. The ones in the middle are you know, mo appropriate for most lights in between. You will also notice that some of them have uh, duplicates. Um, these are not duplicates when you examine them closely. One is gimmicked and one is not. So this will say maintenance whether you're really close up or really far away. The two other cards are um, both examples of something I call the Subtle Monkey. Uh, we'll get to that shortly. Speechless. In this, you take away a person's ability to read. How you frame that is up to you. Whether you want to say, I'm going to hypnotize you, you'll go into a pre-verbal state, which is nice. I mean, I think there's a really nice point in a person's life when they can speak, but they can't read. It's like they can, they're can they aware of the world, but they can't really analyze it. And, and I think in some ways that's the, the moment of childlike wonder that we're trying as magicians and mentalists to instill in our audience. So to, to play this up, I think it is quite poetic and, and beautiful. Um, or you can just, you know, play the Svengali and I touch their forehead and take away their ability to read. Um, you can cast a spell. You can do it any way you want. Uh, the cards in this effect are designed so that they look one way. They look like words, slightly, slightly long words, words that are prone to be mispronounced, uh, words that a uh, five-year-old would have trouble pronouncing. But when you look at them close up, can you see that? You probably can't. They're not 
any recognizable words. They might tease you into, oh, I recognize that word. So, uh, indispensable, you see at the beginning of it, Indiana. So, your, your mind just sort of jumps to that, and you go, Indiana, Spobla. Conscience becomes Ku Chisney, the double C is, um, you know, it's common in, in, in Italian. So we have some familiarity with it, but no one really knows how to pronounce it. So it's it's meant to baffle people a bit. Uh, other words are, you know, they, they, they very directly tie into the theme or whatever themes you want to play up. Education, for example. Now, there's quite a lot of comic potential in this. Um, I mean, there's a Monty Python sketch, uh, all based on... Uh, people unable to pronounce words. Uh, it is a funny thing to see someone losing their ability to read. Let's talk about how to end the effect. Uh, one way is with this card, applause. If you show it to the spectator on stage and they say applesauce, applesauce, apple, try to mess with it that way, and then only at the very end reveal it to the rest of the uh, audience, it is a very nice applause cue. At the end of the effect, it's a really good idea to give them back their ability to read. One nice way of doing that is to say, I will now give you back your ability to read, and I will do it in three, two, one. And as you, you count backwards, you step away from them. And now can you read this word? Uh, they will see the word visually transform, and it can be a really magical moment. It can be a moment that they will have themselves that the rest of the audience doesn't share, uh, share so it shows on their faces, and it can be just beautiful. Uh, I, I've talked to some people who love this, and other people think, I don't know, it's coming awfully close to the giving away the methodology. That, those kind of things are really personal decisions. Uh, I leave that up to you if you like that finish or not. Um, it's really pretty, it's very magical looking, but yeah, it does come a little close to revealing the methodology. Your call. If you approach them as you are um, doing the induction and walk away as you are releasing them from it, the blocking kind of hides. Uh, the methodology, and I think that's more than enough uh, because it's a, it's a lovely moment. In 1952, in the jungles of the island of Kojima in Japan, scientists made one of the strangest discoveries of all time. They were studying a troop of macaque monkeys in the wild when one day they saw one do something they'd never seen before. He washed a sweet potato. The other monkeys were quite interested in this. You see, their sweet potatoes were dirty. And pretty soon, another monkey began to wash his potato, and then another, and another, and it was all proceeding quite normally until a certain threshold had been reached. And suddenly, other macaques in other parts of the island started to wash their sweet potatoes. Even monkeys on different islands, living in isolation, began to wash their sweet potatoes, it was as if the idea itself was in the air. So that's an introduction I use for the 100th monkey effect. Uh, that's a true story. Supposedly, um, scientists have since poked some holes in the theory, um, and there are other examples which support and disprove the theory. Uh, it's pretty controversial. But anyways, I always thought it was a really cool idea that if enough people are thinking a thought, that thought can travel through the air. Uh, there's studies which supposedly, if enough people do the um, New York Times crossword puzzle during the day, it's easier for people to do it in the afternoon than in the morning, just because a bunch more people have solved it. Or maybe because they're wider awake. Um, I leave it to you. But it's a, it's a lovely, um, very poetic story and at least a little bit of evidence for, um, for a, a beautiful, sort of magical idea. I have wanted to use this in a magic effect for a long time, and this was the first thing I thought of when I hit on these hybrid uh, image word uh, techniques. Uh, because with this, you can get the entire audience to think of the same thing. 
There are a lot of different techniques that converge to make this effect possible. There are two main methodologies. Uh, one explored in chapter two of the written text is called the subtle monkey. I'll be doing dealing with that now. Uh, and then the slightly more complicated version is in uh, a later section. That's in chapter one of the book because I've switched them. The basic setup for all the hundredth monkey effects is this. You have someone standing on the stage, you stand behind them, you hold a large card so everyone in the audience can see, large depending on your uh, size of venue, and uh, then you ask them to think of a thing and it should match. This uses a technique known as dual reality. It's something that's hundreds of years old, but uh, I think it's going through a little bit of a resurgence right now. Very cool stuff can be done with it. It basically means that the effect that the volunteer on stage perceives is different than what the audience out there perceives. It can be very slightly different, it can be quite different, but it's just different. So you have to think about your phrasing and how you how you frame the effect. This combines the uh, hundredth monkey principle with psychological subtleties. For example, you see the word cabbage. When I look at this, I see carrots. Ah. The idea here is you take a well-known psychological force, such as the carrots force, uh, as in um, name any vegetable. First one that pops into your head. It's more than likely going to be carrots. Second choice, broccoli. So you can always do name any vegetable. First that pops into your head, any vegetable like broccoli. That cuts down on the chance that anyone's going to pick broccoli. But you usually don't have to do that. This is quite well known. It actually became an internet meme, which uh, sucks a bit uh, because it was a pretty reliable force. This, I think, really freshens it up because you hold this up for the entire audience to see. So if you get everyone in the audience to think of this word, you don't say it because you're behind them and you don't want them to know. You get them to think of this word and you all concentrate on it. And then you ask the person on stage, think of a vegetable. First one that pops in your head. Turn around. Is this it? They will look at this and they will go, yes, that's it. What the audience thinks is going on is they think they've all been concentrating on cabbage and this person just had cabbage pop into their head, which is remarkable. Who thinks of cabbage? Um, close up, it actually says carrots. See the morph? It's, as long as you, you, you ask it the right way, you say, is this what you thought of? And it will say yes. It's the most natural thing in the world. They don't, it's kind of unusual to say, yes, I thought of the word carrots. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. Another one here, well-known psychological force. Um, to the audience, they see the word begonia. You hold it up, you ask them to think of the flower first that pops into your head. Imagine everything, imagine the color, imagine it, visualize it, and now, is this what you're thinking of? They thought of a begonia. Of course they didn't think of begonia. They thought of a rose and the color red. It is, again, a well-known psychological force. And someone's coming home. Hello. Uh, second most likely choice in that case is Daisy. Apparently, according to uh, an effect by Paul Draper in Psychological Subtleties 2, I think, by Banachek. Brilliant book. Um, the second most likely choice is Daisy, especially among uh, younger uh, audience members. Again, you can cut that one off at the knees by saying, think of any flower like a daisy. Okay, then it's like, yeah, I'm not going to think of a daisy, that would be stupid. So they will think of a rose and it will more likely be red. So you've got a, a very powerful effect because the rest of the audience thinks, wow, begonia, that's crazy. So what happens if it doesn't hit? Um, that's always a possibility with the psychological force. Um, Banachek talks about some ways to get out of that. Um, one of your big advantages with this is nobody knows in advance how many times you're planning on doing this. So if you get the begonia right off, you can end right there. If you uh, don't hit begonia, nobody can see how many cards you have, so you can go to the next one. If by chance you don't hit this one, uh, I would suggest raising the stakes and going for one of the cards with two on it. Uh, I talk about this technique 
in my article, The Joy of Failure. This is a technique screenwriters use all the time. Um, a character fails at something and they, they are faced an even bigger challenge and so when they succeed in this one, it, uh, it, it seems much more powerful. This one from a distance says throne and chest. Close up, table and chair. Ask a person to think of any two pieces of furniture. This one, from a distance, cat and toad. From uh, close up, a person on stage will see car and tree. In this case, you, imagine, you ask someone to imagine that they are at home, look at the front window, and they see two objects. What are they? Um, a well-known, very effective psychological force. You're probably going to hit one of those. Um, here's something else. Um, mycosis. Hold this word up. And then ask a person to think of a childhood disease. Most, most likely they're going to say measles. And that's what it says close up. There's one other technique I outline in the text for using psychological forces with uh, the hundredth monkey. And that's something I call hundredth monkey with two outs. For this, you have a, a card that morphs between the two most likely outs you will get when you ask a question. For example, um, think of a color, the most likely answers are red and blue. So the way this works is, you hold up a card for the audience to look at, it says red on it. Everyone concentrates on that word. The tricky part of this is that while you have a high likelihood that you're going to hit on one of those two, you're not sure which one. So you have to introduce one other step. What I like to do is to have a photograph and it has a variety of colors on it. Uh, it has some red, but it has no blue. Then you ask, do you see your color in this photograph? If they say no, then they probably pick blue. And then you say, oh, that's good because um, I wanted you to pick this, and they will react because they see blue. If they say, yes, it is, I say, okay, we're good. Everybody tell them what color you were thinking of, and they will just shout out red, and they will, uh, your person will say, yeah, that's what I, uh, I thought of. There's also um, a very cool uh, psychological force uh, by Colin McLeod that he allowed me to include on this. Check that one out on the... Uh, on the written instructions, because you have to get the text just, just so. The Hundredth Monkey. Unlike the versions using psychological forces, these hit all the time. Uh, there's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off, because we're not real magicians. The trade-off is you have to get the spectator to write down their answer. Um, your preference, whichever you like to use. You can combine it with psychological forces. Um, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. This version is a little conceptually tricky. This is hard to explain. Mm. Basically, the cards in this have two words. One is a category of thing, like month. And the other is an example of something from that category, like March. The audience sees the word March. The person on stage sees the word month. You see? Category month, example of that category, March. You ask them to think of a uh, month, and they could very well say March. Not always. Um, it's not a psychological force. Here, Canada morphs into country. Here, ro uh, Radiohead morphs into rock band. Here, Oldsmobile morphs into automobile. Okay, so that's how the cards are set up. How do we use that? Let me run through it. Um, let's say you have one person on stage, and you can have more than one, but let's just say you have one. You hold up the card, get everyone in the audience to think up the word March. Then you ask the person on stage to think of a month and write it down. Now, you have to figure out what they've written down. Fortunately, we mentalists have hundreds of years worth of techniques for figuring out what people have written down. If you've got one of those little 
you know, expensive electronic uh, pads, use that. That's great. I like Acidus Novus. Very quick, very efficient, very clean. Oh, did I mention you need a pencil? A short pencil you can either finger clip from the beginning or have in your pocket. I like the finger clip because it's really easy to. Once you know which month your volunteer has thought of, you basically just write it down on the card right under the main word. Uh, you'll notice on all these cards, uh, it's a little bit fainter right underneath. This allows you to write their word on it. So at the end, in the revelation, you say, is this your word? They're going to see the word month and their month written on here, January, underneath. The fact that it has little squiggly lines here or on this card hides the pencil writing from the audience at large. So you can show it to them at the same time. I like to stand behind the volunteer, ask them to turn around and say, is this the car you thought of? They will see the word automobile and Hyundai written down here, and they will say yes. The wider audience will see Oldsmobile, and they'll think, holy crap, that's amazing. This example, you've asked them to think of a country, uh, the, everyone in the audience thinks they've chosen Canada. You, the person on stage sees the word country, and then whatever you've written underneath. Uganda, perhaps, or Luxembourg. What's your excuse for getting them to write down a word? Well, what's your excuse when you get them to write down a word in, in any mentalist effect? In some sense, you don't need one. Um, that doesn't mean it's not a valid question. It doesn't mean that you can't think about the process a little bit. The short answer to that is, um, write it down because I say so. I'm in charge, this is my stage, I know how to, this works, you don't, just do what I say. Uh, and that's valid, especially if you have a bit of an authoritative character. Uh, other people like to really think it through and say, well, you know, I've just had too many people, you know, lie about what they were thinking um, to make me look bad. Um, you could turn that on its head, you know. I don't want, you know, some people are, um, they're too nice. Uh, I will T this will totally not work, and um, they will say, oh yeah, that's what I was thinking of, even when I wasn't thinking of that, so get them to write it down. I like that. If you have several volunteers on stage, you can say to the first one, don't say it out loud, I don't want to influence the next few people, just write it down for me. And while they're doing that, you can show the word for the second person. Uh, and then while the second person is writing it down, you can show the word for the third. To be logically consistent, you really shouldn't have the third person write down their word then, um, because there's no reason for them to hide it at this point. So you may want to do it where the first two, you're using this technique, and then in the third, you go to one of the psychological forcing techniques. Um, if that is the case, uh, I would do the revelation in reverse order start with the third person because there is a chance of failure on this and you don't want to end with a failure. Here's another really interesting way of combining the two techniques. Uh, have three people up on stage. The first two, you're going to use psychological forces. The third, you're going to use the card that says a long number when viewed from far away, but close up it just says number. So the first two people, they do not have to write down their words. The third person does. Why? Who remembers uh, a six-digit number? The reason this is nice is because the first two people, there's a chance of failure, but your third one is just remarkable. Hitting a six-digit number and, and having a fail-safe, that's a nice build on it. And it's relatively easy as you're doing the revelations for the uh, first two uh, uh, spectators to scratch the six digits on the third card, and then you've got a very strong ending where you nail a, a six-digit number. Um, if you're going to miss one of them, miss the first one. Uh, instead of an eight, uh, have a nine. And then every number after that, hit, 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 strong finish. I think everyone's familiar with the concept of, uh, of an idea just being in the air, uh, the zeitgeist. Um, I, I think it strikes people as uh, intuitively, you don't have to develop it. I, I like to. I like to tell the story of the 100th monkey because I'm, I'm geeky that way, but you don't have to. There are 
completely other presentations um, that use these cards. For example, um, if you want to do a mind control or I'm going to put a thought in your head kind of effect, uh, you stand behind them and you say, I'm going to try to put a thought in your head. I will let everyone else in the audience know what thought I am going to try to put in your head. They see the word cabbage. And you say, now I want you to think of a vegetable, any vegetable, turn around, is this the one you thought of? They will see carrots and say, yes. So you put a thought in their head. The same basic technique, but an entirely different plot. You can use this as an example of a spectator reading your mind. The same basic setup as, as 100th Monkey, they're facing the audience, you're holding up a card and saying, I am concentrating on something, I'm concentrating on this. It is a vegetable. Think of a vegetable, first one that pops into your head, turn around, is that the one you were thinking of? They have just read your mind. So you don't have to talk about monkeys, if you don't want to. But uh, I like monkeys, so you got to get some monkeys. The sixth scent. I always think it's nice when an audience leaves a mental show knowing more about mind reading than when they went in. I know it's not real, but we're storytellers and uh, the audience deserves a full, rich story. Even if it's all make-believe, uh, you want it to be real. And sometimes small details can create that world, make it more vivid. That's where I was coming from when I was doing this effect. The thought that, though it's hard to read someone's mind, it should be easier to tell what kind of thought they're thinking of. And I, I came up with this idea that you could tell generally what kind of thought someone is thinking. Um, in the same way that you walk into someone's house uh, and you know if they're cooking Indian food or Italian food or French food, you know if they're meat or fish, you know, you get the basic type even though you don't know the exact um, meal that, uh, that's on the stove. So that's, that's the, the premise of this piece. Um, I called it originally 100 Monkeys Upside Down because it's basically the same cards as the original 100th Monkey effect, but exactly reversed. And what would happen if I put it the other way around? What could I you know, do with that? Where the audience sees month, automobile, country, furniture. I've got four cards. I invite four people from the audience. Uh, I explain to them that these are all different types of thought, and uh, I, I, I hand them the cards, I turn my back, they mix up the cards, each one takes a card, and then presses it to their chest. You are able to tell very quickly by the aroma of thought that, uh, which they are thinking of. Are they thinking of a unit of time, like months? Are they thinking of a thing, like uh, a piece of furniture? Um, are they thinking of a country, um, uh, a place? Are they thinking of an emotion? Um, here's another thing for a thing. I printed up the wrong cards. Anyway, while your back is turned, they distribute the cards amongst themselves, then they hold them to their chest. And now you come and unerringly tell who is holding which card. Now, the secret of this is, okay, I don't want to blow your mind here, but the cards are marked. That is it. It is very simple. The cards are marked on the back. That's all I, this, is, this is not marked, it's photo paper. I provided some marking. Uh, here are the, the marks I've provided. Um, you'll see that there's a first letter, like an F for furniture, uh, an M for month. So you can, you can tell right away which card it is by just looking at the back. These are kind of subtle. If you want a stronger marking, uh, you know, pinching around the edges of the cards. Um, you can, if you want to be really subtle, you know, put a magnet in a piece of foam core board and use a, a PK ring. Um, you can use a variety of methods for marking these. They speed through this because the point of this is that you can tell this faster than you would in normally reading a thought. So you do this two or three times quickly, you tell who's got which card. The thing that really puts this over is the kicker, because you tell them exactly what thought they are thinking. So it's not just a month, you tell them which month they are thinking. That's where these cards come in. The audience in the seats are going to see the word month. 
the people handling the card are going to see March. You really should check out the scripting that I have in the written instructions for this because it's 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 nicely worded so that you can say I want you to be very specific about your thought so that there's a dual reality that works for both the people on stage and uh, the people in their seats. Um, you know, as far as the people on stage are uh, are concerned, they're passing around a word uh, that says March, and they're concentrating on March. And only at the very end, uh, very end of the effect, do you say to them, "You are thinking of a unit of time, a month. The month is March." Now, to them, they're thinking, "Yeah, of course, you got it right." Um, to the audience, they're thinking, "That's like one step beyond. You've told them exactly what unit of time." And there's no question, there's no pre-show, there's no anything else. To them, it's an absolute miracle. Um, uh, the same with country. You know, the people passing this around are, are, they think they're looking at Canada. And then when you say at the end, you think of a country, Canada. It's a very, a very effective uh, finale. And that's what really makes this trick, um, you know, really, really lovely. Dual reality is a marvelous technique. You can do miracles with it. Some mentalists avoid it because they are concerned about what will happen when um, people um, talk about the show afterwards. Uh, the people who are on stage, the people who are in the audience, who have different recollections of what happened. The first time I did this effect was at a group called The Elders, uh, a group of mentalists in Los Angeles. And one of my on-stage volunteers was an excellent mentalist named Alan Gittleson. Discussion turned to, well, what happens if people compare notes after the performance? And Alan's take was this. The illusion was so perfect for him on stage, he just would not have believed the other person. No, it said this. He would be insistent, and they would each be insistent of their own point of view. So much so, they might reach the conclusion that the only possible explanation was that the on-stage volunteer had been hypnotized. Which is not, you know, the worst thing. You could uh, leave them thinking. So I myself am not worried about um, after-show chatter. Uh, I think uh, this could lead people into some pretty interesting mazes of trying to figure this all out. Just a word about the JPEGs. There is a file on your DVD full of artwork to create cards. There is, at my last count, 173, I think, uh, different files. It can be a little overwhelming. You're going, what the heck? Uh, what are all these things? A lot of them are just duplicates of the same artwork for different light levels. The mid-range should work pretty well for most purposes. Um, the bright works better in bright light or if you're using large cards. Uh, the dim is better in low light circumstances. Blank, what you can do there is just print it up and then print it through again. Um, my parents told me. Print it... Uh, okay, Stevie, that's good. You're a good boy. You can print them up any size you want. You can put them on uh, electronic um, devices, laptops, uh, iPads, a phone if it has a, a reasonably large size screen. You can um, go to Walmart and have uh, posters made. If you, if you see something like the word wanton morphing into the word weapon, and you wonder, what the heck is that for? Um, go to the um, written instructions. Uh, there are some um, secrets there that I have not included here. Let me just give you a brief overview. I've got, the, I've got the files here in front of me. They are arranged alphabetically, as files will be arranged. Um, the sixth cent um, cards are first front of the cards, the back of the cards. Oh, there's some pretty blue colored ones. After that, there is um, the hundredth monkey cards. Oh, there's elephant uh, morphing into airplane. That's good. I'm going to leave you to discover how you can use that uh, on the written instructions. That's in chapter two, children. Um, there's, oh, there's a whole bunch of very pretty little backgrounds that you can add. Oh, look at them all. 
That's crazy. Then we get into the uh, speechless cards. Uh, then there are at the end some speechless cards for the uh, for uh, phones. I um, didn't go overboard on this because every every smartphone has different dimensions and but basically you want it kind of to fill the frame. And I didn't I didn't test what all the brightness levels of every smartphone are. So you kind of have to do your own tests with your own smartphone to get the right size uh, to choose if you want the to use the bright, mid, or dim. Uh, you could be using them on tablets, which come in a variety of sizes and a variety of, of brightnesses. But once you got it figured out, you can use it again and again and again. You can know automatically before you go in without any testing uh, how what your relative distances are. Uh, the person uh, looking at it close up, he's good from one foot to three foot. There's a sort of gray zone between four and five feet, and then six feet to infinity. It's the other word. Um, you can just map it up beforehand, uh, and then you're good forever. One thing that uh, I'd like to add is, is with my last release, Tossed Out Book Test, there were a lot of ideas that I had after I released it and other people had. So I encourage you um, to register uh, by sending uh, an email to me at chris at magicaonline.com. As these ideas come in from people, I will, with their permission, of course, share share them with you. Yes, there is a um, a secret password um, that you should include in the subject line as you do, and the password is Possum Dixon. There's two words. I hope you enjoy the Hundredth Monkey and Speechless. I hope you get a lot of use out of it. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Chris Philpott, and this is The Hundredth Monkey. What's in this package? Um, postcards, two DVDs, you've obviously found one of them. Um, that's the one with me giving the verbal instructions. Uh, the label says that it also has PDFs and JPEGs. Don't believe it. It was just such a mess to try to get it all in one. So we put those off in a separate um, So we put those off on a separate uh, DVD. So we put those off on a separate DVD. Um, so we put those off on a separate DVD. Hi, I'm Chris Philpott, and this is the Hundredth Monkey. What's in this package? Postcards, uh, two DVDs. You've obviously found one of them. Um, hi, I'm Chris Philpott, and this is the Hundredth Monkey. What's in this package? Well, postcards, two DVDs, you've obviously found one of them. Uh, the other one has um, JPEG artworks that you will need for the effect and uh, a PDF of written instructions. And a PDF of written instructions. The label on this DVD says everything's on here. Uh, it's not exactly true. At the last minute, we decided to split the the label on this DVD says everything's on this. The label probably says that everything's on this DVD. It's not true. At the last minute, we decided to split them. It was just much easier to navigate that way.